Hi, welcome to the final section of Unit 3. This is our last existence theorem. Uh, we are talking about the mean value theorem. Um, our learning objective is the same. We're going to use existence theorems to describe behavior. The assumptions we have to make are, of course, is it continuous and closed? And that's the same for all of them. The big difference here is you also have to test differentiability, which now that you know der derivative shortcuts, this is actually really simple. Instead of testing the formal definition of differ differentiability, you can actually test the derivative, take the derivative, and find its domain. If its domain is all real numbers in that interval, then it's differentiable in that interval. If there is a funky point in that interval, then it is not differentiable in that interval. And I'll show you what I mean by that. If you have domain errors is, in essence, what you're looking for. And then what does this mean? It means that there must be at least one point of C. And what does C represent? C represents your X value between the interval A to B and that's the x interval a to b, at which the instantaneous rate of change must equal the average rate of change. And what does that mean? Um, beforehand, we used to know that the instantaneous rate of change, which is the derivative, was approximately equal to your average rate of change, which is that f of b minus f of a all over b minus a formula. The big difference here is it's no longer approximately. It must equal. That's our big, big change here is that this is no longer an estimation of the derivative. It is the derivative. You have a secant and tangent line that must be uh, parallel. They must have the exact same value. Um, so our conclusions would be this formula, which I wrote down real quick at the bottom, but this is what you would be looking at. And again, note, it no longer says an estimate. It is exactly equal. And because it's exactly equal, you can actually end up solving for this C value, which is what we solve for more often than not when you are solving for a mean value theorem question on the calculus exam. Here is that uh, visual explanation of it. You can see that you have your tangent and your um, secant line. The tangent line is this pink line right here, and the secant line is the black line right here. And um, what that shows you is that they are parallel between those two intervals, which means they have the exact same slope, which is why your derivative, your instantaneous rate of change, can actually equal your average rate of change. Okay. We have a specialty theorem within the mean value theorem, and this supposes that we meet all the conditions of the mean value theorem, but f of a is equal to f of b. And if you recall, you've seen something similar like this before. This was with the intermediate value theorem, but instead of them equaling, they could not equal each other. So if you ever have an f of a and f of b that do equal each other, I suggest that you check if it meets the conditions of the mean value theorem, which means that it is continuous and closed, and it is differentiable, which means if you take its derivative, are there domain exclusions in that interval? If there aren't domain exclusions, and it must be differentiable, at least one time differentiable. Because of this, you can all, not just assume that F prime, your instantaneous rate of change will equal, equal your average rate of change. What you can actually assume here is that your instantaneous rate of change must equal zero. There must be some sort of slope that um, is happening where there's a horizontal tangent line. And so that means there's usually some sort of peak or valley, some sort of mountain or valley, max or min. Okay. Oh, I think I put that in there twice. But here is the visual aid that I was showing you. So as you can see, on the left, you have f of a equaling zero. On the right, you have f of b equaling zero. So that means that f prime of c must equal zero. And f of a and f of b don't have to equal zero. They just have to equal each other, which is what they equaled in this instance. So how do we solve for it? Well, graphically, it's rather simple. You can see, if you can see the function is continuous and differentiable, then you can ensure it meets all of the assumptions. Then you can identify uh, your slopes or any sort of information from the graph itself. You might have to identify um, F prime or you might have to identify the average rate of change or both. Graphically is a little bit different. Analytically is actually where we solve MVT more often. And the first thing you want to do is solve for continuity and differentiability. Again, you can solve for your continuity and differentiability by taking the derivative and looking for their domain. You can also assume continuity for certain parent functions. For example, if you have a polynomial it's going to be continuous on that interval unless it's a piecewise function then you've got some funkiness happening show your proof that your instantaneous must equal your average rate and then solve for x or c 
Okay, so here's my first example. We have this f of x, and we are asked, does it meet the conditions of the MVT? And if it does, solve for c, which again, this is an x value. So make sure you recognize what you're solving for, because f of x is actually a y value. And I see some disconnect between what is your x, what is your independent variable, and what is your y, what is your dependent variable. I see some confusion in that in class. So please, please, please make sure you differentiate today. Okay, so what two conditions are we looking for? We're looking, is it continuous and on a closed interval? And is it differentiable on an open interval? And why do we care about those two? Because with continuity, we can actually test those endpoints. With differentiability, it becomes more difficult to test those endpoints because you may only have those endpoints and you may not be able to see outside of it. So it's okay if we can't differentiate from the left and the right. That's why it's okay that it's an open interval. Okay, so here we have the function f of x equal to 3x squared minus 4x plus 1. Well, this is a polynomial, so I know that it must be continuous everywhere. And since it's continuous everywhere, that means f of a and f of b must exist. So that means that these closed interval points must exist, so we're good to go there. But what about differentiability? Well, I might take the derivative, so f prime is equal to 6x minus 4. And guess what? That's a linear parent function, which is also continuous everywhere and um, even on the interval a to b. So that means it, it is also differentiable. This domain is all real numbers. There are no exceptions. There is nothing I could do to this where I would suddenly end up with a zero in it or an infinite on bottom or something like that, where I would end up with an undefined point or an indeterminate point. There's nothing that could happen here. Um, more often than not, you're looking for kind of a fraction. If you can get a zero on bottom, there might be an undefined point. So since it is continuous and differentiable, it means it satisfies the, the conditions for the mean value theorem. So I can assume that f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. That's my assumption. So now I have to take a second to solve for f of b and f of a, and that's this information. My f prime is going to come from this equation, and all I have to do is solve for c, which again is my x value. So I'm going to clear that board for just a second. So my f of b is actually going to be f of 4, and my f of a is going to be f of 0. So let's plug those in. 3 times 0 squared, well, that's going to 0 out. 4 times 0, that's going to 0 out, plus 1. So my only answer there is 1. This is going to be 3 times 4 squared minus 4 times 4 plus 1. So this is 16. This is 16. This is 48 minus 16 plus 1, which I believe was 33. So that becomes uh, 33 minus 1 all over 4 minus 0, which is equal to 32 over 4, which is 8. And my f prime was 6x minus 4, and I set that equal to my average rate of change. Now I solve. 6x equals 12 divided by 6, so therefore x equals 2. So this is it. This is my c. This is my c value. So that is the number, that is the number c that would satisfy the conclusion of the mean value theorem. And that's how you would solve that. I have a slightly more complicated question. Um, here we have uh, f of x. This is a rational function. And so we need to check if it is continuous and if it is differentiable. So continuity, I would check by plotting this graph or testing between 1 and 4. Um, and so I know that if we plot this graph, we end up with, uh, what is this? Something like this. I think it looks like that. And then between 1 and 4, it is continuous. Okay, um, so how could I plot that graph? I could have plotted it using my knowledge of the parent function and transformations, but that's a little more confusing because this is an x over x statement. But uh, I could have also plugged in, I could have made an xy table and plugged it in, or I could have just plugged it into a graphing calculator. So it just kind of depends on what the question is and what you are provided to solve for that question. Uh, then I take the derivative, and so this is the quotient rule. So real quick, I'm going to declare my u my u prime, uh, sorry, that's 1, my v, which is x plus 2, and my v prime, which is 1. And just a second, I know that my v squared is going to be x plus 2 squared, which if I need it, is if I need it foiled out, that's what that is. So this is going to be the inside pair, so that's going to be x plus 2 minus the outside pair, which is just x, 
all over your v squared, which is x plus 2 squared. These x's are going to cancel out, so I'm left with 2 over x plus 2 squared. So now I need to check, because we are still trying to satisfy conditions. We know it's continuous. We're looking if it's differentiable between 1 and 4. And we need to check if there is domain errors. So 2 over x plus 2 squared, where would there be a domain error? So with rationals, we assume all reals. Then we set the denominator equal to zero, and we figure out if there's any point where I would exclude. Well, in fact, it would be at negative two that I could not have differentiability because there is no domain in that spot. So if there's not differentiability in negative two, I need to check that that's on my interval. Well, negative two does not lie between one and four, so we're good to go. That means it must be differentiable between one and four since the only exclusion point is negative two. Since it's continuous and differentiable, I can go ahead and satisfy the condition that f prime of c would be equal to f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. So my f prime, again, was x over x plus 2 squared. And then my f of b is going to be my f of 4. My f of a is going to be my f of 1. So this is going to be 4 over 4 plus 2, which is 4 6, which is 1 third. No, 2 thirds, sorry. Then this one is going to be 1 over 1 plus 2, which is simply 1 third. So if I plug that all in, that becomes 2 thirds minus 1 third here, f of b, f of a, all over b minus a, 4 minus 1. This is going to be 1 third over 3, which is the same as saying 1 third times 1 third, which is 1 ninth. So I set these equal. Well, that makes it nice and simple. I don't have to deal with any sort of rational uh, manipulation because this is cross multiplication, right? Oops, this wasn't a 2. This wasn't an x. This was a 2. Our x is canceled out on top. Ah. Okay, there we go. So this becomes 2 times 9, so I'm going to cross. So 18, and then I'm going to cross this way, is equal to x plus 2 squared. Uh, I solve for it, so that's going to become the square root of 18 equals x plus 2. And then... I move that, neg that 2 over, and that becomes negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 18 is equal to x, which is our c value. I would check if either of those do not fit within my interval. And so negative 2 minus the square root of 18, well, that's going to be another negative number, which means that can't be it. So actually, my only answer would have been uh, a positive square root of 18 minus 2 is equal to my c value. So it's important to double check. I didn't even, I already boxed that information, but that was incorrect. All right. So really here, all I need to know is why would these fail to satisfy the conditions of the mean value theorem on the interval from negative one to one? So that's this interval right here. And then that's this interval right here. So why would it not satisfy it? Okay, well, I look at this, this graph on the left and I'm like, hey, wait a second, that is definitely continuous because I can draw that line without ever picking up my pen. So it is continuous. So check yes, it meets the first condition. What about my second condition? Is it differentiable? Well, we can't assume continuity means differentiability. In fact, there's one of the three Different, non-differentiable points, and there is a corner right there. Just a reminder, my other non-differentiable points would be the cusp as well as a vertical tangent. So that would be why this one on the left does not meet the conditions. So it is not differentiable at x equals zero. What about from on this graph, graph B, from negative 1 to 1? Well, as I look, first condition, continuity, hey, boom, I, it is not condi co bleh, continuous at 1. And some of you might say, well, it's at 1. Do we include it or exclude it? Remember, your continuity has to be included even until the end point. It's your differentiability that can be funky at an end point. So this one is not continuous at x equals 1, and that's why they fail to sat satisfy the mean value theorem. Okay. To wrap up, here are my assumptions, here are my conclusions. So again, it has to be continuous on the closed, differentiable on the open. If those conditions are met, 
then you can set your derivative, your f prime, equal to your average rate of change, your f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. And you can actually solve for your c value, which again is an x value. If you have the Rolle's theorem, which says f of b and is equal to f of a, so if you end up solving and finding out that f of b and f of a are equal to each other, then you know that f prime must be equal to zero. It just has to happen. I'll see y'all in class.